Well, good evening. We're back in the continuing study of Colossians. Last time I had given you uh, an introduction, and we had talked about the theological uh, bad teaching that was sneaking into the church at Colossae, and one of the reasons that Paul wrote this letter was because of Gnosticism was coming into the church, and so he's combating that. But now I want to talk about the purpose of, well, this, this is a continuation, the purpose for Paul writing. He had three reasons for writing. Number one, he wanted to express his personal interest in the church. And you'll notice that in all of Paul's letters, there is always this personal touch. He was sort of the elder over all of these churches that he had founded. And he had a love for the people. He had a concern and love for the church. And then secondly, he wanted to warn them against going back to their old pagan vices. Uh, we'll see that later on when we get to chapter 3. And then thirdly, he wanted to refute the false teaching that was threatening the Colossian church, that early form of Gnosticism that was creeping in. Uh, and, and he meets this Colossian false well, it's an idea of knowledge. Remember, I don't know if you remember, but there was secret knowledge. That was the basis of Gnosticism. And only the enlightened people had this, this secret knowledge. But Paul combats that by talking about the full knowledge of God that is found in Jesus Christ. And one of the most powerful parts of this whole letter is the exaltation of Jesus Christ that Paul does in this letter. He sets forth the positive nature, the exalted nature, the unmatched glory that is Jesus Christ. Now, what is the theme? What is the theme of Colossians? Well, the theme is the absolute supremacy and the soul sufficiency of Jesus Christ. There is no, we talk about this many times in preaching and teaching, there is no other way to God except through Christ. There is no other manifestation of God except Jesus Christ. One theologian has said that Colossians is Paul's full-length portrait of Christ. He's God's Son. He's the object of our Christian faith. He is the Redeemer. He is the image of God. He is the Lord of creation. He is the head of the church. He is the reconciler of the universe. In Him, in Christ, dwells the fullness of the Godhead. And under Him, every power and authority in the universe is subjected. He is the essence of the mystery of God. And in Him, all God's treasures of wisdom and knowledge lie hidden. He is the standard by which all religious teaching is to be measured, including the truth that's foreshadowed in the Old Testament by the, the regulations and the rituals of the Old Testament. And through the cross of Christ, He conquered the cosmic powers of evil. <clears throat> And following His resurrection, <coughs> pardon me, He was enthroned at the right hand of God. As Paul says, He sits at the right hand of God. And our life, and this is the most important part, I think, our lives now lie hidden with God in Christ or through Christ. But one day, both He and we will be gloriously manifested. It's an exciting, it's an exciting thought. Our lives are, are, we are in Christ. We are mingled together. We, we lie hidden in Him in the presence of God. Now we're going to look today, or the first part of our study begins with the doctrine of the preeminence of Christ. And that's chapters 1 and 2. And, and we're going to talk about how Paul fo follows a standard letter-writing uh, procedure as he presents Colossians. And the first part of any letter is the salutation. 
And that's verses 1 and 2. That's the salutation. And as I said, Paul follows the standard form of greeting that you would find in any first century letter. But he puts a Christian content to it or adds Christian content into it. He, he's going to name himself as the author in verse 1. He's going to identify who the readers are, and that's the, uh, that's the way you did it in letters of that day. Then he's going to give a characteristic greeting. Uh, <clears throat> and he sanctifies everything by immediately relating both the sender and the person's address, the recipients, to Christ. He, he puts us both in Christ, Paul and us. So look at, let's look at verse 1. Let me get my Bible. And let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So Paul, first of all, starts by designating himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, you all aren't in the room with me, but let me ask the question, why does he do that? Why does he say, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus? Well, he does it to establish his authority for writing this letter. And he would often do that in his letters. He would establish his, his credentials. He is an apostle. He is chosen by God. He is sent by God. And the reason that he does that is because he was not one of the original 12 disciples or 12 apostles. Let's look at one other greeting that he does. Turn with me to Galatians. <coughs> Galatians chapter 1, and see how he identifies himself there. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Everybody turn there. He writes, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So that's a pretty bold statement. He, men didn't send him. God sent him. Uh, to write to the church at Galatia. Here he is, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, not by men, not by anyone else, but Paul saying, I was chosen by God to be an apostle. Now, what does the name or what does the word apostle mean? We hear it used frequently, particularly in the, the uh, charismatic churches. It simply means messenger. An apostle is a messenger. He is one who is sent. He's sent out by God to preach the gospel. But then, at a deeper level, the way uh, we used it with the original 12, they were, they were authorized spokesmen for God. They were commissioned and empowered to act as His representatives. And the original 12 apostles were one who had walked with Jesus Christ. They had seen him, they had heard him, they had touched him, and they were the apostles. Now he says, chosen by the will of God. And that means that he was appointed by God. This wasn't just a matter of, oh gee, I'd like to be an apostle. I think I feel called to be an apostle. I want to go preach and teach. No, he was called by God to be an apostle. And here he uses the term to designate Paul as a commissioned ambassador of Christ. And do you remember where he got his commission? Do you remember on the road to Damascus, the Lord struck him down? And then uh, the Lord tells, uh, who was Ananias, who went to pray for Paul for his blindness, that I will show him how much he must suffer. But Jesus commissioned Paul on the road to Damascus to be an apostle to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And then he acknowledges Timothy. He says, and Timothy our brother. Now, obviously, Timothy was with Paul 
as he sits in prison and he writes this letter, and he's identified as a brother, which simply means he's a fellow Christian. He's a brother in Christ. Uh, and Paul names him simply as a matter of courtesy because Timothy is there with Paul, but it pe appears that he didn't have any part in writing this actual letter to Colossae. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 2 of chapter 1. All right, so the salutation, number one, he identifies himself as the writer. It's interesting that when we write a letter, who writes letters anymore? It's all email or text or whatever. Uh, but when we write a letter, we identify who wrote it at the end. Love, Ernie, or, or whatever. We, we write the, who it's to, dear so-and-so. Uh, although I guess now with text messages, it's identified when you receive it as to who it's from. So who's it written to? To the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. To the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Wouldn't that be a great uh, designation for for someone to say about us, I'm writing to you, Bob, a holy and faithful brother, or to you, Sue, a holy and faithful sister. What a, what a, what a wonderful way to be called or to be identified. Now, in the Old Testament, holiness was not ascribed just to people, but also to places. There were holy places. There were holy things. You remember all the fixtures in the tabernacle and all of that were holy. And, and so this tells us that the root idea of holiness or being holy, and, and many times in the older versions uh, of, of the Bible, it would write to the saints where we use that word holy. Hagios is the Greek. It, it means it's translated as the saints, the holy ones. And that's what the saints are. They are holy. So the root idea of holy is not some excellence of character, not some something that's in us, but it, it indicates dedication. It's, we are dedicated to, we have been set apart for the work and worship of God. Anything that is holy is set apart unto God for His use. There's also the idea, this, uh, this word faithful, he says the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, the faithful should really be interpreted as the idea of believing. But it also indicates that these, that they're set apart to Christ, but they are loyal to Christ. Uh, and this is especially important for a church that's under fire. Let's stop there and we'll pick up next week and continue.